This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast, and we are moving ahead in our study of Murray Rothbard's magnum opus, Man, Economy, and State, into the second part of the book, which was originally intended to be part of the first book, but as we will find out, it became a second volume called Power and Market. And we've worked our way through the first 11 chapters of this book already, for those who have been listening along. And I know what some of you are going to say. You're going to say, no, 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 Jeff. We haven't studied chapter 12 yet, the economics of violent intervention in the market. Why are you skipping chapter 12 and heading directly into the power and market section of the book? Well, here to explain exactly why we're doing that is our great friend, Patrick Newman. Probably, I'm going to go ahead, Patrick, and say that you are the biggest 20-something Rothbardian on earth. Would you say that's safe? Uh, Yes, Uh, I I would say I I think I've earned the honor. Okay, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Someday, someday, maybe you'll be the most prominent 30-something yeah. uh, Rothbardian on the planet. But at any rate, you know, there's some confusion around this book. Again, Murray Rothbard was writing it in the 50s, uh, published originally in 1962. And what we now think of as a separate volume, Seven Chapters of Power and Market, uh, was in his original conception going to be part and parcel of the main branch of this book. So g- give us a quick and dirty explanation of what happened. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk about Rothbard in uh, Man, Economy, and State. Uh, so, Rothbard wrote the chapters 1 to through 11, uh, you know, the economics of, of the free market economy. And then he started to write his chapters on interventionism, and he wanted to present a giant sort of uh, overview of intervention, you know, have it just be one structure. So uh, not necessarily kind of hodgepodge or jumping around between systems, et cetera. And anyway, so he also wanted to present uh, the economics of defense in private law and et cetera, because Rothbard did not take the assumption of other free market economists that you at least had to have a government. So you had to have at least the night watch, you know, night watchman state or the, the minarchist state, et cetera. And then he, uh, so he presented, you know, he went through these chapters on, uh, on intervention. So going through private law, going through the basics of intervention. And he was even criticizing uh, calling taxation, sort of theft or an intervention itself and comparing it to sort of criminal activities and so on. And anyway, so when he had written the book and he was trying to find a publisher, uh, someone from the Volcker Fund, who Rothbard was basically getting funded to write the book for, his name was Frank Meyer. Uh, He could sort of be considered a a fusionist between the libertarianism of the 1950s as well as the conservatism of the 1950s. And he advised, uh, and it was sort of somewhat of a requirement, I guess, that the material that later became Power and Market be cut, published as a separate book. Uh, He said, well, it's anarchist. Uh, You're putting in political assumptions, et cetera, even though Rothbard really didn't. He was still very concentrating on a value-free analysis. And he said, well, you just need to write a chapter kind of covering some of the stuff that you were talking about. Uh, And that was what later became chapter 12 of Man, Economy, and State, split into two volumes in 1962. And then later, Power and Market got published in 1970. Well, that's so interesting, because if you look back at human action, and in some senses, this book is is a, a an analog to human action. In many senses, it isn't. But, you know, Rothbard never went so far. He talks about the hampered market economy. But it's very much in keeping with Rothbard, the conceptualist, to say, hey, if we're going to use something like the evenly rotating economy as a construct to help us understand things, if we're going to use something like a Robinson Crusoe situation to help us understand things, we ought to look at the completely unhampered market economy where all goods and services, even police and courts, are provided by markets, even if we're just doing that as a conceptual ec- exercise to help us understand the economics. Yeah, exactly. That's a, it's a very important part of Rothbard's analysis. And it's, it, it's, it's trying to understand, OK, how could the market how, how could the market work? We can use theory. We obviously don't have to we don't require an empirical example of 
sort of a pure market economy or anarcho-capitalist society in order to learn from it, you can use these imaginary constructs, these mental experiments to go through this. And Rothbard uh, starts off by analyzing, okay, how can markets provide law? Uh, how could this system work? These were obviously ideas and concepts that he later sort of clarified and say for new liberty and ethics of liberty, et cetera. But, you know, he already sort of was laying out the groundwork for this anarcho-capitalist uh, conception of law in uh, private defense services, et cetera, uh, that he later uh, built upon. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a very important aspect, especially because Mises kind of leaves it as somewhat of like a black box. Okay, all right, the government has to provide uh, you know, law and order, has to run the courts, has to run the police, et cetera. Otherwise, you're just gonna have total anarchy, You know, the bad anarchy. Uh, this is what Mises says. And so then the government also just has to have some taxes that will support those. And those taxes aren't interfering with the market. And then, OK, now let's move on. So it's it's sort of like, OK, well, how does this actual, you know, is this still an intervention? Uh, you know, can do governments need to provide these services, et cetera? Yeah. So Rothbard obviously is always one to provoke, you know, challenging questions and to provide uh, unique uh, answers to them. Yeah, and it's fun for those of us who, for whom this book was not their original introduction to Rothbard. It's fun to go back now and read this and see where he was developing some of his later ideas in a proto form, so to speak. And of course, he had thinkers like Gustave de Molinari to look at, but uh, like uh, Morris and Linda Tannehill didn't write their book, The Market for Liberty, till I believe 1969, I want to say, maybe published in 1970. So the idea of private courts and private policing was was a radical one, let's just say, in the 1950s when he's writing this. And so chapter one, A Power and Market, I think, Patrick, is, is just so fascinating to me. I mean, here we've got these riots in Kenosha. Uh, we've had riots in Portland and Seattle and Los Angeles, other places in this country this year, Chicago. And in most of these cases, the police have been ordered to, to stand down and basically retreat and allow, in some cases, the loss of life to occur, but in many cases, uh, significant loss of property to occur. And um, Hans Hermann Hoppe has this famous uh, line where he says, you know, the market produces goods, as in goods and services, the government produces bads. And so it feels like with respect to police in the current environment, sometimes the police, I, I'm not one of these cop haters, you know, I think there's going to be police in any society, whether private or public. But it seems like oftentimes police come along and produce bads. You have a victimless situation. There's no real crime. It's a routine stop. It escalates. Something horrible happens. Whereas when we really need them to go in and protect Manhattan and all those beautiful stores on Fifth Avenue or, or to protect the mom and pop shops in Kenosha, Wisconsin, of all places. They're not there. They, they're they're in a retreat. So they either they either give us bads sometimes, or they give us nothing. And and so, you know, looking back over this chapter last night to prep for our conversation today, Patrick, it struck me that this this chapter is not pie in the sky. I mean, this has real relevance today. Oh, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's uh, you could always say Rothbard's writings are, are timeless, and that sometimes you know you look back at them, or you know there might be certain periods where they're especially, uh, you know, uh, salient. And yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, we've heard a lot about, you know, because usually the entire discussion is always that, you know, government needs to run the courts and the police. End of discussion. Anything else is just absolutely ridiculous. You're crazy. Uh, you know, if, if you don't have these services, then, you know, society will just collapse and so on. And you've obviously seen a lot of discussion about the police and uh, criticisms of the inefficiency of the police and et cetera. And yeah, it provides a lot of interesting uh, material, especially for day today when you see a lot of discussions about, oh, defunding the police and, you know, moving beyond them, et cetera. Uh, I'm obviously a totally uh, a proponent of private defense agencies and all of that. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes I think a lot of the current discussion of defunding the police is more of just a subtle code word for nationalizing state and local, mm. uh, you know, police, which is, a, I guess, a different, you know, discussion entirely, but it's one that's ultimately related to what Rothbard's discussion, because his analysis of private defense agencies is heavily based on uh, decentralization and competition, 
uh, between those agencies and so on. But yeah, it's, it's a very uh, relevant uh, chapter. And it's also, it, it bears emphasizing because this is something that doesn't, you know, we're not living in this world anymore. But in 1950s, early 1960s America, I mean, it was the height of the Cold War. And that was also the beginning when of the time when conservatives sort of moved away from that old right and became more of the neocon uh, national you know, review. So the Soviets are the bad guys. We need to bomb them into oblivion and so on. So especially taking that position as someone who affiliated as a conservative in the 50s, you know, Rothbard. I mean, that was that was a really controversial uh, idea. And that's definitely played into why that material had to get sort of axed and published, you know, 10 years later or so when the climate was different. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, you know, it was, it was timely then. And it's also timely now. It's, it's just an issue. You know, it's obviously always a very fascinating, uh, kind, you know, just the result of all of Rothbard's writings. Well, there's that famous conversation, which has been recounted in various books between Murray Rothbard and Nathaniel Brandon and Ayn Rand, where they were quizzing him and questioning him on how private defense agencies might work. And they brought up this concept of what happens when there's a dispute, don't you need a court of, uh, of final say, so to speak, a court of final opinion. And they, so when, you know, they famously said to him that this is going to turn into civil war. <laughs> and yeah. here we've got we we don't exactly have private defense agencies operating in in big, uh, deep blue mega cities in the United States. It seems like we got civil war anyway. Yeah, exactly. So you know the idea is that yeah, of course there's there's always there, there could be minor you know there could be disputes obviously among these private defense agencies and nothing is ever going to work perfect. But of course people always assume that it's going to automatically be worse than the current sort of. Uh, status quo when, you know, we already have everything uh, centralized. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's it, that, that, that is a very important concept in Rothbard's uh, argument, the, you know, the, the system of sort of appeals courts, and he tries to uh, lay this out further in, say, for New Liberty and Ethics of Liberty, when he talks about sort of the libertarian legal code and things like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, and then this is something that is really a fascinating, uh, a lot of these arguments, you know, when you look at Rothbard cites Bruno Leone, uh, Freedom and the Law, and then someone later, uh, The Enterprise of Law, Bruce Benson, Rothbard praised it, uh, that book came out later in Rothbard's life, uh, you know, looking actually at concrete examples of how uh, various market law has been created, you know, private defense agencies or merchant law, admiralty law, et cetera. And you actually look at it and you, you see how they analyze, you know, how they resolve disputes and, you know, because they didn't want to go to war because it cost money and et cetera. Uh, you know, that's, you know, kind of a lot of ways, you know, great illustrations to sort of refute that line of thinking where it's just, oh, this, there's no way this could work. It would lead to civil war. You know, actually, you look at the examples and, you know, the situation turned out pretty good. Of course, when you look at are centralized examples, the situations don't always uh, turn out as good as the proponents say they will. Sure. And the centralizers generally don't have skin in the game. I mean, I think we can envision an environment where insurance companies underpin everything. And in fact, insurance companies employ the security forces. And so because they're ultimately on the hook for damages, for lawsuits, uh, and can be fired uh, for failing to provide decent security, um, th then we see that they would have an incentive to help you prevent crime in the first place, to uh, not escalate situations, but rather to de-escalate them, uh, to avoid conflagrations like we're seeing in some of our cities, to design buildings and stores and even cities, perhaps, in ways that discouraged rioting and looting. I, I mean, there's, so, there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of layers to the onion, and we don't know what it would look like if we'd had private police for most of, let's say, the 20th century. But you can Im imagine it, and you can also see that what's happening now with police unions, with qualified immunity, which is a mixed bag, uh, with uh, oftentimes police uh, retiring pretty early with swollen salaries and all this and that, um, you know, there's just this sort of whoops when the police screw up, but there's because there's no competition, there's no recourse to the customers who are in effect you and me.
Uh, I completely agree. I mean, in, in having the government run any agency is going to result in inefficiency, bloated retirement salaries, uh, you know, lack of a feedback mechanism, and you know, and so on. And people will, you know, oh, the government shouldn't run the post office, which is good. And you know, they generally will always, you know, be defensive, pun intended, I guess, about defense agencies. Uh, but, you know, you still have the same logic. And I think it's becoming more, uh, I, you know, hopefully at least somewhat more acceptable. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what will happen and if there will be actual sort of decentralization and any sort of uh, widespread use of uh, private defense agencies in the future. I mean, because the uh, yeah, the, the, the police are in many ways, you know, they're just a giant, inefficient government bureaucracy, government union. Uh, you know, they, they suffer from all of those problems. Uh, now, unfortunately, the current, you know, a lot of the protesters, they're not saying the police, we need to get, you know, they're a giant government bureaucracy. <laughs> you know, they're, they're inefficient. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still um, a lot of, you know, what Rothbard's describing is, is still very uh, timely and applies to today's uh, current environment. Well, what Rothbard doesn't really get into in this chapter, we'll wrap it up here is something that our former summer fellow Tate Fagley has written about, for example, and that's what would punishment look like. I think punishment and proportionality are very, very tough subjects for libertarians. I might even go so far as to say they're blind spots. And I think we could agree that we wouldn't have these lengthy, expensive incarceration factories for people who are you know, nonviolent especially, but there has to be some sort of punishment and it has to be meted out uh, presumably by the defense agency. And I think it would look more like restitution to specific individual victims rather than this amorphous concept of the prosecutor on behalf of the people prosecutes uh, a perpetrator. And then the perpetrator goes to prison at 50 grand a year to the taxpayers. I mean, that's the opposite of restitution. That seems like we're paying double. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's something I think Tate Fegley's done great work on that. I know that's something Rothbard, uh, revisited later in the 70s and he, and he wrote on that. I mean, that type of uh, it would definitely be more of a restitution framework instead of imprisoning someone. You know, this is all part of the evolution where when someone committed a crime, you know, back in the day, especially with a lot of these private, uh, you know, law, uh, you know, either things like common law, merchant law, admiralty law, uh, et cetera. You know, you had to pay restitution because you were committing a crime against another person. And then, of course, the king got involved and he said, well, wait a second, I got to get in on this action. Uh, there's a lot of money being sloshed mm. around. And then it became a crime against the king or sort of a crime against society. So if you steal something, you're you know, you're you're a threat to society. And that's why we need to lock you up. Uh, you know, and you, you won't you know, the restitution aspect. You know, you're actually uh, harming someone's private property. You know, that always gets uh, neglected. And that's just part of the sort of just gradual sort of collectivist kind of thinking we often have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that it's, it's, it's a very important part. And because a lot of people would think that, oh, in a anarchist society or whatever, you just have, you know, giant private prisons and uh, all sorts of stuff involving that. And, and it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look the same. It'd be much more restitution based, uh, much more where you're, you have to pay the person who you, you know, the property you violated, uh, and there'd be ostracism, reputation, or sometimes use of force, you know, force to enforce mm -hmm. those, uh, that, that payment. But you know what, Patrick, dopey libertarians have to get over sometimes this kumbaya idea. I mean, there are super violent predators, you know, deeply unreasonable sociopaths, psychopaths in every human society. And they are going to have to be dealt with sometimes violently by some sort of security apparatus. I mean, let's not lose sight of this. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you're, you're going to have those people and they would, you know, they're, they're caught stealing or something. They might, you know, be, take a shot, uh, you know, while they're doing that or something else going on. And you're absolutely always going to have those uh, problems. And unfortunately, you might even have those people, you know, involved in some of the defense agencies. Uh, of course, the idea is that, well, you know, we're always going to have those problems, but in under what society would that be minimized? Because <laughs> uh, usually a lot of those violently sociopath individuals, you know, they end up working for the government, right? <laughs> At least that's 
or they highest. become or they become governor. <laughs> yeah, or they become governor, or you know they'll they'll work even for uh, you know unionized police or something like that, et cetera. I mean, and that's always a general uh, problem that why the you know the defense agencies uh, people say, oh, well, you're going to have all these problems, and we can immediately think of a bunch of science fiction worlds and et cetera. But they imagine that you know, oh yeah, these violent predators, they're somehow not involved in any of the agencies running our current society right now. You know, so, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There are definitely people who are, you know, they, they just do not want to belong in the voluntary market and you have to deal with those people accordingly. Well, when we get into chapter two, the fundamentals of intervention, it's interesting because in human action, Mises talks about, uh, you know, a laissez-faire system, albeit with a democratic veneer of taxes for certain services. Uh, and he talks about the total state. Uh, whether that's socialism or communism. And then in the, the middle ground, he talks about the hampered market economy. So the organization is quite different. Whereas here, Rothbard gives us something which I believe is, is brand new at the time in the 50s, which is this sort of three-part typology of intervention, uh, autistic, binary, and triangular. So I'll ask you what I asked Joe Salerno, I think, back when we were covering some related, to, related topics in human action, which is you know, do you think this was helpful? Do you think this three-way uh, definitional split is helpful, or do you think it is sort of uh, pedantic in the sense that it tries to to shove things into categories? Uh, so, you know, a, that was one of your. You're absolutely right. That was something Rothbard at the time said that uh, this is a you know big contribution of mine. If you actually look at his progress reports for the Volcker Fund, uh, Joe Salerno and I are working on a project, sort of analyzing the history of man economy and state. And Rothbard comes out and he says, yeah, I've developed this sort of systematic theory of interventionism to sort of try and improve off of what Mises was doing, which could be kind of, like you said, you're sort of bouncing around. You're not necessarily analyzing like all of an intervention. Uh, I think it's ultimately helpful. I think sometimes it can be confusing. In some of Rothbard's later writings, he mentioned the need to improve upon uh, Sometimes his his uh, his typology, but I ultimately think it's definitely an improvement, uh, particularly because and this is something Rothbard mentions in Man Economy State is that most economists, they will concentrate on triangular intervention. So when the government tries to interfere with an exchange between two separate parties, binary intervention, uh, when the government is trying to coerce an exchange or a gift is not. Uh, usually analyzed because the concept of taxes is seen as well. You know, most economists will take the uh, Oliver or Wendell Holmes taxes are the price we pay for, you know, modern civilization, et cetera. Uh, and they'll say, well, that's per se not an intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, but Rothbard would say, no, it, it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's coercion. You're interfering in the market. Uh, and I can show that you don't need taxes for a market economy, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think it's, I think it's it's ultimately helpful. Uh, I think sometimes, you know, don't get concentrated on splitting the hairs between them. Uh, but I, I think it's an improvement, definitely, to have a systematic breakdown of the various categories of intervention. So what would be an example of an autistic intervention where you just have the state forcing an individual to do something? Uh, uh, I require you to wear a face mask. Okay. <laughs> OK, so that's that's just between, you know, the government issues an edict and, and you you either do it or you disobey. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So a triangular where there's three parties involved, I can imagine something like the state says, you, Jeff, have to pay. You open a deli. You have to pay your new employee X a certain amount per hour. Yeah, minimum. It, exactly. Yeah. Or saying you, Jeff, cannot open up your deli unless you, as well as everyone in that deli, is wearing a face mask or something like that. OK. Uh, but yeah. OK. Yeah. So it, exactly like you said, some sort of price control or prohibition and so on. OK. So the, the intermediate, the binary is is ta taxes, for example? Yeah, it would be taxes or sort of a, a like a gift, a uh, coerced gift. So, yeah, you are forcing an exchange. Someone has to basically pay uh, taxes in in return for something else, like some sort of government spending or sometimes, you know, not even at all. Uh, it's just sort of forced tribute, which is actually where taxes, uh, how they originally developed. Well, the, 
he spends some time in this chapter talking about utility, the you know the utility to the broader economy and the utility of the parties involved, which Rothbard argues is always enhanced by allowing them to do what they want to do. In other words, from a praxeological perspective, as opposed to intervening and forcing me to, uh, for example, to pay a certain minimum wage when that is not, in my view anyway, in my personal utility, the best and highest use of that money. But what struck me, Patrick, in, in looking this over again last night was this, this sounds a little different than, let's say, 70s and 80s Rothbard, all this talk about utility. It, it conjures up a little bit more of, of the Misesian uh, of thinking about the economy. And I, I would imagine like a Stephen Kinsella saying, why do, we, why do we even talk about utility? We should care about justice. And that e- even economics ought to align with what is just and not align with what is unjust. So, but they, there, there is a little bit more of that sort of textbook feel here when we're talking about maximizing utility across the economy. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, Rothbard, he wrote a paper in the 50s uh, towards the reconstruction of utility and welfare economics, sort of going through this. And I think, I, you know, I, I find his arguments on utility and intervention uh, the most convincing, and this is something that he also sort of carried through in the 70s, sort of as a bridge, especially when he's talking about utility ex post. So his his welfare theory is that okay, if we you know you have a system of uh, you know ex ante, you know the market activity always demonstrably increases utility because people are always voluntarily choosing their uh, their highest you know feasible alternative with the government. Uh, you can't say utility increases because uh, one party is gaining and someone else is coercively uh, hurt. They're, you know, they demonstrably cannot use their private property. Um, and uh, when he talks about ex post, he actually analyzes the sort of the market mechanisms that actually ensure why people uh, will, you know, why uh, businesses will produce the products that people want. Uh, you know, what's the, the, you know, the mechanisms that will ensure, okay, profit and loss, competition, uh, the, you know, just uh, reputation and so on. And that's something he also discussed a lot in, uh, in the 70s and sort of comparing it with the government inefficiency and so on. Uh, you do kind of get more of a textbook feel, I guess. Uh, but I, I think it's, uh, it's a highly important uh, part of, you know, the market economy. You know, the market is inherently just, but it also promotes out activities that benefit everyone. It's sort of the, uh, you know, kind of like, I guess you take the best of both the utilitarian and the natural rights arguments. Can you expand on what you just said that markets are inherently just? Well, so if you take the natural rights perspective, you know, markets are based off of self-ownership and homesteading. So, you know, analyzing the market, uh, people are not, you know, aggressing on others. So, you know, markets, you, you own yourself, you, you, you acquire your property through uh, appropriating the earth, uh, either through gifts or exchanging a surplus product that you have for, uh, you know, between other individuals, you know, with other individuals and so on. So, you know, you can show that it's inherently just because it's basically, you know, it's based off of natural rights. It's how man will, you know, needs to survive and so on. Uh, and you can make that sort of natural rights perspective. Uh, and you also can show that, you know, they 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 go hand in hand is that that also is the system that benefits uh, people. Um, you know, it, it, it provides the greatest uh, human flourishing and beats every other system by a country mile. Doesn't even come close. You know, capitalism is inherently just and it's also inherently beneficial. Well, I think that's very well said. Uh, when when he talks about utility ex post here, I, in a sense, it presages, I think, Hoppe's book, Democracy, the God that Failed, because entrepreneurs have profit and loss signals, uh, you know, to go back and look at whether what they was doing, what they were doing, you know, the good or service they were providing and how they provided it worked, provided value. Whereas governments often look back at a particular policy and the people who enacted that policy may not even be here. And, and if that policy is an egregious failure, like let's say crime increases, n- not only do they not suffer a loss, they oftentimes increase their budget. They tell taxpayers, we need to increase the police budget, for example, because crime is on the rise. And, and in, a, in a very real sense, this shows how democratic politicians uh, 
uh, not only don't have the right incentives, they may well have the wrong incentives. Yeah, exactly. So that's a very important, especially when he talks about democracy, and that's been expanded upon uh, by Hoppe and others. You know, if you ask your average person, they say, which is a more effect, which is a better system, more effective in providing the goods and services people want, markets or democracy? Unfortunately, your average person is going to say, you know, democracy. You know, markets are evil. They're exploitative. They they leave people out, et cetera. Democracy, well, it's based off of, you know, it's the majority. It's somehow the mythical 51 percent gets to dictate to the rest of the world how to behave, you know, et cetera, and so on. And, you know, this is something that Mises criticized and Rothbard builds upon is that sometimes market defenders would say, well, the market's like a democracy. But Mises criticized this in Rothbard as well. You know, actually, you know, democracies are imperfect markets because democracy, it's winner take all. It's all or nothing. You know, one one party is going to go home upset. The other party is going to go home triumphant. The market, and this is something I always try to emphasize, especially to students, is that the market segments, you know, you can have uh, Italian uh, industry, you know, Italian food for people who like Italian food. You can have Mexican food for people who like Mexican food uh, and so on. And you can break it down and you have those incentive structures, those feedback loops to ensure that entrepreneurs are producing the products people want. Democracy, much more inefficient. And people don't even realize it. Usually a two party system. Winner takes all. Most people aren't even interested. Uh, you, the feedback mechanism is only indirectly through elections, even though most agencies, laws, et cetera, are not voted upon uh, and so on. And uh, you have an incentive to just try and expand your budget and to try and take as much from the people while you're, uh, you know, serving political office and so on. And if, when you actually sort of rationally analyze the market versus, the, you know, democracy, uh, everyone should be saying markets are much more effective means at producing goods and services people want. Unfortunately, we're not there yet, but you know we'll eventually get there. I'm hoping. <laughs> well, Patrick, I love the power and market section of this book. I think it's just it's it's a really interesting, fascinating, fun read. Uh, I I think people can read it as a standalone section or even as a standalone book. We offer it in both. Uh, formats to people who are interested in getting the book from us. But, um, you know, you can read this as a standalone. And if you've been listening to podcasts and have maybe skipped a few chapters or skipped a few shows, or you've been a little hit or miss in your personal life, keeping up with your reading, I mean, there's nothing wrong with starting at chapter one of Power and Market and, and going from there. And then, you know, hopefully later on making time for the earlier book. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Power and Market is definitely, it can be read as a sort of standalone uh, book. I mean, in a sense, that's kind of how, that's how it was published. Uh, I mean, if you have a basic working of, of the market, and even Rothbard kind of goes through how the market works and profit and loss, et cetera, at the, uh, at the beginning. And, you know, he, he juxtaposes, you know, goes through how the government doesn't work, uh, et cetera, on and on. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a great read. Uh, it's something that you can read uh, separately and, uh, you know, it can even make sometimes things clear if you're reading it separately uh, and you're not, you know, sometimes when you get to the end of the book, you might not process the information as clearly enough. So with a giant three volume work, Man, Economy and State, you're going to get that. But uh, with Power and Market, you know, you start right from there. I mean, it's definitely uh, uh, it, it can be read as a standalone book. Well, Patrick, we got to wrap this up, but get, tell us a little bit about, about what you're working on. You finished the, this supposedly lost fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty, which is Rothbard's in, incredible historical treatment of colonial America. You uh, finished the Progressive Era, which was a series of essays that were sort of found in his papers, and which is about just what it, it's called, the Progressive Era. And I know you're working on some other Rothbard projects at the moment. You mentioned one earlier that you work on with uh, Joe Salerno. Uh, yeah, so I am in, in terms of the Rothbard projects. I'm working on sort of a we're going through a history, be around a shooting for around 120 page kind of you know monograph going through the history of man, economy, and state, like the intellectual development, not necessarily the history of the project per se, but how Rothbard was developing these ideas, and also very importantly using archival evidence to show how Rothbard was communicating these ideas to Mises in the 1950s, and Mises was sort of approving them. You know, one of the things we found is that in the 50s, Rothbard gave a lot of paper presentations at Mises' NYU seminar, and Mises commented on them, et cetera, because uh, sometimes some 
uh, Austrians will say, well, you know, Rothbard was different from Mises, was sort of developing a different economics. And, you know, of course, there are obviously differences among theorists, but very clearly Rothbard was in the Misesian paradigm trying to develop that, uh, trying to build upon uh, that system and, and really sort of showing uh, sort of going to the history of thought, because that's one way of also uh, learning uh, the material when it's presented in a different way, specifically, especially because Rothbard sometimes described things differently in some of those paper presentations or uh, in other sort of archival documents that we have uh, discovered. Um, and I guess I'm also working on a history of cronyism. So in many ways, applying uh, the theory of power and market to early American history, sort of the period after conceived in liberty, uh, and showing how, because uh, one of the things, and I know you'll be talking about this later on in some of the other chapters, is the various monopolistic grants of privilege. Um, Rothbard discusses that, you know, it's a very big feature of cronyism and crony politicians uh, and businesses supporting these regulations to crush competition and benefit and enrich themselves. So sort of got both of those on the plate and looking forward to uh, having them coming out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for chapters one and two of Power and Market, which are the addendum of sorts to Man, Economy, and State. We just have four more chapters to go in this book. We hope you've been listening along. We hope you will continue to read along and uh, and stick with us. When we finish the book, we've got a whole slate of great books that we're going to be doing because this is the Human Action Podcast. We are committed to delving into real books to tackling real substantive econ topics on this show. And Patrick Newman's been a great part of it. He's uh, been, been a huge help, a uh, really interesting guy. And, and Patrick, I'm going to not only say thank you, but on behalf of our audience, I'm going to say that you need to get on Twitter. <laughs> we, need, we need to have you wasting your life away in useless arguments and spats on Twitter so that we can keep up with what you're doing a little better. Okay, well, thank you. I will. I, I'll. I will make an effort to uh, to do that. I'll. I'll get on Twitter. I know my uh, my father's on Twitter, and he always talks to me about how great it is. Uh, and people have always been telling me that. So I will. It's on. It's on the list. It's. It's. Your it's dad's on, the list. on Twitter. Your dad's yeah. on Twitter before you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Is your yeah. dad on TikTok? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't, think, yeah. I d tell you, I don't want, you, I don't want anyone's dad on TikTok. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And I'm a dad. So, <laughs> late, ladies and gentlemen. Go to the Mises.org store. Use the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast. You'll get a discount on this book and lots of other books that we've covered in the podcast. And we will be back next Friday with the next couple chapters of Power and Market. Thanks so much and have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.